Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 17, and I'll just read to the end of the book. <laughs> I'll just read to the end of the chapter. I was trying to see how many of y'all were paying attention. Uh, I'll read to the end of the chapter, and then we will begin our survey of the book of Matthew. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to, Bab to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which, means, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, how many of that's the first time you've ever heard that read? <laughs> no, that's good. That's, a, uh, that's a, uh, a common passage of Scripture for pastors to read and to preach through uh, at Christmas time. It's important, though, in the scheme of uh, of Matthew, as he begins to present Jesus as the Messiah. Remember, that's one of the distinctives. He's presenting Jesus as the Messiah. And so it's no accident that he, that he calculates the genealogy of Jesus from Abraham to David, and from David to Babylon, and then from Babylon to the Messiah. Those are important segments of the history of God's people, because really they are segments of the history of God's promises. Uh, God's prom God made promises to Abraham, he made promises to David, he made promises concerning Babylon, and he made promises concerning uh, Messiah. And so here we have them all marked out. And then immediately Matthew begins to tell the story about Jesus. And so with that in mind, let's, let's begin. Uh, I want to show you ag again the, uh, the outline that we'll be using. Uh, it should be right there on your, uh, on your handout that I gave you. But here's the outline that we'll be going through. The prologue, verses, I mean chapters 1 and 2. The gospel of the kingdom, chapters 3 to 7. Uh, the authority of Jesus and expansion of the kingdom, chapters 8 through 11, uh, opposing the kingdom of uh, the gospel of the kingdom, uh, chapters 11 through 13, understanding and misunderstanding the kingdom, 13 to 19, opposition and eschatology, 19 to 26, and then cementing the kingdom, uh, which is J Jesus's death, burial, resurrection, um, great commission, ascension, all there at the end, cementing the kingdom, that's it. And I want you to see that I've built this outline, in fact, I've borrowed this outline from someone else, uh, because of its focus on the kingdom. So all of this has to do with the kingdom. And there'll be, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about the kingdom in just a moment. But, uh, but every gospel, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, shows um, John the Baptist and Jesus coming, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. So this, this idea of the kingdom is an important one for us to understand these gospel narratives, and really for us to understand what Jesus came to do. Uh, we have to see it in the, through the lens of the, of the kingdom. Are there any questions? That's kind of where I left off last week. Everybody good? Everybody with me? All right, here we go. The first section or the first uh, part of the outline that I want you to see is the prologue. It's chapters 1 and 2. 
And uh, I'll just show you what makes, up, make, makes it up. I, I read a little bit of it to you. Uh, we saw the genealogy of Jesus. Those are the first 17 verses. Uh, and 17 kind of encapsulates it, and that's where we talk through. Why is it important that we know the genealogy of Jesus? Sue said, because it's prophesied. That's true. Yeah, so th those two things are true. Um, that this is an answer to the prophecies. So these prophecies are fulfilled. But then also that not only are the prophecies fulfilled, but this Jesus is the one that answers all the promises of the Old Testament. That in Jesus, now remember, and by the way, this is important, and Greg is not here, that rascal. Greg Bars asked me a question two weeks ago, and I told him to hold on. I would answer it today, and here we are, and he's not here. His question was, if you remember, as I was introducing the Gospels two weeks ago, I, I intimated that Jesus said that he was God, that in his, in his confession, in, in the way he carried himself, he indicated that he recognized that he was God. And Greg came up to me afterwards and said, Jesus, and everything that I've read, Jesus never came out and said, I am God. And in fact, what we'll see in the book of Matthew, but also in the book of Mark, there are times when Jesus does something and he tells them, do not tell people this. Don't go out and tell them. Does anybody want to hazard a guess as to why Jesus would say to keep it a secret? His time had not yet come. When will that time be? Not yet. No, no, no. So his time, the, so there's two things. There's two things. I hate to say no. I mean, all your answers are so wonderful, but they're wrong. <laughs> so uh, there, are two, uh, there are two ideas of his time. The first is some of the time that Jesus said, don't tell anybody, his time to be um, betrayed and arrested and killed had not yet come. All right. So that's one of those times because he didn't want to speed up that time. There was things he needed to do before, uh, because, because ultimately when he showed who he was going to be, the answer was death. That's the way, and, and we'll get to that in just a second, but death was always on Jesus's radar. He was always headed to the cross. Is that fair to say? Are y'all good with that? Okay, good. Then, then you'll understand what I say in a little bit, a little bit better. But he was always headed to the cross. The cross was not a, a plan B. The cross was always the thing that he was going to do, because that's how he's going to save the people from their sins. We even see that in the angel's declaration of Joseph here, where he says, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from his sins. But there's a second there's a second indicator, actually there's a primary indicator, but a second time that his time would be right. And that is Jesus was to be, was to be shown that he was the Messiah, that he was the one by one clear act. What was it? The resurrection from the dead. Remember Paul says in Acts as he's preaching there in Greece that, uh, and God appointed a time by a, and he appointed a man that he was going to judge the world, and he demonstrated that by raising him from the dead. And so it's Jesus' resurrection that demonstrates his triumph over death, hell, and the grave, his success in his mission. Um, up until that point, by the way, nobody really understood why a Messiah would die. Because how can a Messiah do his work if he died? How can we follow a Messiah who's died? Well, he did die, but then he was raised again. And so the, this Jesus doesn't clearly state who he is, clearly. I mean, it's not clear until he rises again from the dead. And that cements it all. That, 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 and that's why I use that word cement. That, that is the stone that it's all built upon, is the resurrection of Jesus. Everything else Jesus did was important. I don't mean to take away from any of those other things. I just mean that if he would have died and stayed in the tomb, he would have just been a good guy. But he didn't die and stay in a tomb. He died and was raised again. And by being raised, we now know that he is the Messiah. He's the one 
Does that make sense? Everybody good with me? All right, good. Uh, so we see this genealogy of Jesus, the conception and birth of Jesus. Um, this is the message to Joseph that I just read to you. Notice what's promised here. You shall call it, well, first of all, he is from the Holy Spirit. That is a clear indication that he is not of the lineage of Adam. He is, this is how he's the second Adam. He doesn't bear the, um, the, the curse of Adam. He comes, uh, he is of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you shall call his name Jesus. He will be the Savior, save his people from the sins. He will also uh, be Emmanuel, God with us. But then I want you to see that this is also in this little section that I just read to you, the first of the many times that Matthew says, um, now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And remember, one of the distinctives of Matthew is that phrase, all this took place to fulfill. He is showing that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises. And so this runs throughout the book. And so um, that is the Lord's message to Joseph. Starting in chapter 2, we have some birth narratives. They are different birth narratives than Luke uses. In fact, it appears that Luke used Mary, the mother of Jesus, as one of his sources. If you go to, if you read Luke 1, I already read it to you a couple weeks back. We'll read it again in a, in a, in a month or so. But when you read Luke's narrative, um, he says that uh, I, I went to set out an orderly account. And, you know, all these eyewitnesses and things, it seems like he went to Mary and asked Mary about leading up to the birth of Jesus. And so we have her Magnificat, we have her interaction with Elizabeth, we have her travel to Bethlehem, and we have the, um, the birth narrative there. This comes from a different perspective. Matthew's is different. Um, perhaps it's a different perspective because he's highlighting the kingship of this Messiah. But it's also interesting, as we have the introduction of the Magi, these uh, wise men from the east, we have Gentiles walking onto the page. In fact, aside from the genealogy and the, and the angel's uh, interaction with Joseph, the very first people we meet in the book of Matthew are Gentiles, the Magi. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, where is he who was born the king of the Jews? Now, let me ask you this. Why would Gentiles from the east care about, about the king of the Jews? Because he came to save all, why would the Magi or how would the Magi know that the king of the Jews came to save all. How would they know that connection? That's right. And maybe not even just read about the Savior, but they had heard stories about the Savior. All right. So she said, what she said was that they, they had scriptures taken to the east. Uh, when would those scriptures have been taken to the east? In the exile, the Babylonian exile. And so what I want you to see is that almost immediately after saying from the deportation to Babylon, almost immediately he says, and the Magi came back from that direction. Came back from, and probably from Babylon, these, these Magi, they came back. And there was in their mind this prophecy that had to do with a star, had to do with the Jerusalem, uh, the, the king of the Jews, all of these things, and all of a sudden it dawned. Uh, now remember what's happened to Babylon since then. Babylon was this huge empire that had been overtaken ultimately by the Greeks who had been displaced by the Romans, and so now they were in, in decline. They were wondering what, what the next big thing on the calendar is, and lo and behold, God sent a star, and they followed it, to Jerusalem. And so this is, this is huge in the, in the narrative, what Sue said earlier, the, the fulfillment of prophecy and also the demonstration that we're talking about the one 
who was promised from the Old Testament days. That's what Matthew is proving. He's not just telling us a cool story about the Magi. He is, he is showing something. He's done it on purpose. Now, yes, it is a cool story, but that's not why. He didn't do it so we can wear pins on our lapels that say wise men still seek him. <laughs> that's not why I did that. He did this so that we would recognize that Jesus was who he says he was or is who he says he was. All right, and then the trip to Egypt, uh, after they had gone, so the, you know the story of the Magi, the Magi go find Jesus, they get a dream, says go a different way, because if they went back to Herod, Herod would kill Jesus, they went a different way. Now when they had gone, verse 13, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. Listen again. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet out of Egypt I called my son. Do you hear it again? So this recurring theme, this was done to fulfill. This was done to fulfill. And that runs throughout the book of, um, of Matthew. Uh, so the trip to Egypt, after that, the slaughter of the innocents. Um, we don't know how many kids were killed, uh, male children under the age of two, uh, probably just in the area outside of, um, outside of Jerusalem and Bethlehem. That area was probably where these kids were killed. We don't know how many, but there was. The Bible attests to them. And also... Uh, attributes it to the Jeremiah prophecy, a, a voice was heard in Ramah, uh, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. And so again, another prophecy fulfilled. And Matthew is clear about, about doing this. But he's also doing something that is so super fun. Uh, I love this. This is my favorite thing to do in all of Bible teaching. As soon as I tell it to you, you're going to know that I love it. Right now, you may not think it's cool, uh, but at least you know that I think it's cool because I get excited about it whenever I do it with you. I love connecting the dots through the Bible. That's like my thing. I, I love it. I love to tell a people who, who they've not been connected with, say, hey, this is connects with this. That's what Matthew's doing. He's going through and he's connecting the dots from the Old Testament with pointing straight to the Lord Jesus. Remember when you were a kid, you did the dot, the dot things? I, I mean, I, I used to love that. There was no way to get it wrong as long as you knew how to count, right? You just, well, and for me, I was always a perfectionist, and so I liked my lines to be straight, but as I did them, they weren't often straight, and so I didn't really like them. But anyway, I want you to imagine these prophecies in the Old Testament being the dots of a dot to dot. And when you got finished with it, you get to the picture of the risen Lord Jesus. That's what Matthew is doing throughout. He's connecting the dots that's going to lead to the risen Lord Jesus. And everything from chapter 1 to chapter 28 are those dot to dots. Even the things that Jesus did, the healings, the casting out demons, those things are part of the dots that are showing us who he is. Because ultimately, please understand from Matthew's perspective, ultimately Jesus didn't come to heal people. Jesus didn't come to teach things. Jesus came to establish his kingdom. Okay, Jesus came to establish his kingdom. That's the purpose. That's what, that's what Matthew is showing us. And every one of these accounts is part of this dot to dot as he's, as he's building it. Is that a helpful illustration as you see it? Okay, good. So um, the trip to Egypt, the slaughter of the innocents, and then the return to Nazareth. When Herod died, verse 19, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go into the land of Israel for those who sought the child's life are dead. 
So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. And so here we have, there it is again. This was fulfilled. This was fulfilled. There it is. All right. So that is the prologue. It's just an introduction. Yes, ma'am. It is from Jeremiah. It is, the, uh, it is Rachel weeping for her children. Now, in, in Jeremiah, when he says it, it doesn't say that there's going to be a king years and years later that's going to kill a bunch of... But uh, Matthew takes that passage and applies it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to this situation and says that it's fulfilled. By the way, that's another thing that you're going to be introduced to in the New Testament, um, and that is... We have the, uh, the authors of the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit taking passages from the Old Testament and saying, these are now fulfilled in your hearing, even though in the Old Testament you saw them and you're like, I'm not really sure how, that, how that's going to be fulfilled. For one instance, the most famous one, I've, I, if I've mentioned it to you once, I've done 10, 12 times to you, and that is Joel's prophecy of the day of the Lord. Um, that uh, young men will dream dreams and old men will have visions. And remember that that was always about the day of the Lord, the coming day of the Lord. That's Joel chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, at Pentecost, when Peter is preaching, he says this is the fulfillment of that prophecy. All right? And so you always read... You always, there are several things about reading Scripture. One, you read the, the, you, you read the clearer before you read the more difficult. So you don't let the difficult ones change what the clear means. You read the clear ones that are easy to understand, and then you allow them to interpret the, the more difficult ones. And then second, we always use the New Testament as the lens to read the old, not the old to, from the lens to read the new. Does that make sense? Because what we believe is, is that God, I'm going to turn my back on you just for a second. If this is the beginning of revelation, uh, Moses's, Moses's revelation, Job, right, right here, and this is the end of revelation, Jesus glorified, right? Hebrews chapter 1, Jesus is the final revelation of God. So if we go from, from Moses and Job all the way forward to the person of Jesus, obviously we read all of this in light of the fullness of this, right? So we have God's revelation here, but it's not, it's not complete, and it's, it's developing, it's unfolding. We call this progressive revelation. It's progressing. We're getting more and more and more of it, but it only finds its completion in Jesus. So ultimately, we read all of this in light of this. Does that make sense? All right, so in the Old Testament, when they look for a Messiah and they wonder what he's going to be like, we don't have to wonder anymore. We don't, have to, we don't have to do that exercise. We read it and say, aha, it's about Jesus. It's why when I'm preaching on Sunday mornings from the book of Proverbs, I can easily make it Christian literature because I have the fullness of the rest of Scripture. I know how it fits in to the rest. Now, I need to tell you what it meant then. I need you to understand what it originally means, but I also need you to understand how it points to Jesus or it's fulfilled in Jesus or, or whatever. That's what it means to read it as Christian literature. Yes, sir. Uh-uh. So um, the, only, the only real, so we have, here, here are the dates in the timeline of Jesus, his early years that we absolutely know. Without, I mean, there's no question because the Bible says it. We know how old he was when he was born. <laughs> we know how old he was when he was circumcised. Seven days. On the eighth day, okay, so we, we know that. We 
can generally guess how old he was when he left, when the, when, when the Magi came and then Herod got mad and started killing folk, and that is because he killed everybody two years of age and younger. So we can deduce from that that he must have been about two years. That would be a guess uh, or younger. And then the, the only next um, timeline that we have is we know he was back in country when he was 12 at the, at the temple. So that, those are the only hard and fast dates that we have from Jesus's childhood. And then we don't hear of Jesus again until he's close to 30 and getting ready, well, baptized, tempted, and then getting ready to go out and launch his ministry. So we have, we have relatively little from Jesus' childhood. Now, there are some other writings which we don't view as, as Scripture, but there are some other writings that are out there that, that say things about Jesus' childhood, but some of them just are a little far-fetched and strange. And so we don't, we don't hold to those, and really we don't even talk about them much just because they are so weird. They don't really fit who we want, um, not who we want, but who the Bible displays, demonstrates Jesus as being. So that's a good question. Any other questions? All right. Now I want you to see that at least from the time that he was 12, uh, but probably much earlier than that, we skip forward. By the way, oh, 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 here's another date. So we know when... Herod the Great died. We do know that. That was about 4 B.C. So it was shortly thereafter. So Jesus probably did not stay in Egypt for a long, long time. It was probably only a matter of months, not years. But at least he's 12 or younger. We don't hear anything else from him until chapter number 3, verse 1. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Notice what John is preaching. Both. Repentance because the kingdom. Repentance because the kingdom. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself had a garment. So we hear about John. Um, and then all the way down, as for me, verse 11, As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus arrived. All right, any idea as to who John's talking about? All right, then Jesus arrived. Uh, now, we know the story. We understand it all. But wh what I'm trying to show you is what Matthew is showing us. Matthew is taking the Old Testament dots and bringing them forward into the fulfillment of those dots in, in his day and showing that Jesus is the only answer that comes from those dots. That's what Matthew is showing. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and you come to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. And being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And so we have the introduction of both John the baptizer and Jesus um, coming onto the scene. And this is, this is the message that they are both preaching, the message of the kingdom. In fact, both of them are preaching exactly the same message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. They both say the exact same thing. All right, so that leads me for, further to the next section in Matthew, the gospel of the kingdom. This is the introduction of the gospel of the kingdom. Now, I'm going to take a time out here for just a second. I have hesitated 
for a whole week, actually longer, I knew this was coming, I have hesitated on how theological to get in our discussion today. Um, I, 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 my goal in doing the survey is just to teach you what the Bible says. All right, but it's at this point in this gospel, the gospel of Matthew, that divergent streams of interpretation take place. And these divergent streams of interpretation determine everything about Jesus' ministry and the future. Yes, sir? I think your mic went out, so you're going to be on recording. But I'm back. All right, so um, this, this approach to interpretation of scriptures, especially the book of Matthew, but really the rest, really all the gospels, and, and, it, and it changes, in some ways, it changes everything, and it hinges on this idea of a kingdom. Now I'm out of breath. And it, <laughs> and it, uh, it hinges on this, on this idea of what the kingdom is and what happened at the kingdom. So I, I, I've, like I said, I've wrestled with it all the way till last night, and then I just thought, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. So I'm going to introduce you to something that I, and I am not trying to divide the room. I am not trying to be um, a know-it-all. And I am not trying to uh, cause problems that may not be there if you didn't understand them. But what might happen is I, I will teach these things to you, and you may go to a, a well-known Bible teacher or a well-known um, commentary and hear something completely different than what your pastor said, and I at least want you to understand why that is, why it may sound different. Uh, I'll tell you the Bible teachers first and, uh, and, just, and, and show you, and, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the kingdom, and then we'll, hopefully we'll pick right back up and we won't have any problems. But if we have problems, you, I'll, you can ask them and I'll answer them. So the Bible teachers... I will, I'll name the most famous of my parents' era uh, that would teach this way uh, because, and I respect this guy. I'm, all these guys are godly. I like them. I listen to them. I use them. I just don't agree with them on the idea of what the kingdom is. Everybody good with that so far before I start naming names? All right. So my parents' era, and some of you are my parents' age, um, is J. Vernon McGee. And so many of you will have J. Vernon McGee's commentaries. I've got his set at home. Many of you, maybe some of you still listen to him on the radio. <laughs> Though being dead, yet he still speaks. Uh, he's, just, he's on the radio all the time. And so Dr. McGee was a strong proponent for what I'm about to say. In today's time, this is also my parents' age. Obviously, Dr. McGee was way older than my parents, but that's how you kind of how you do. You listen to people who are older than you. And, and then um, uh, in today's time, one who's almost ready to depart the scene, who's had a great ministry, is John MacArthur. So John MacArthur holds to this, although probably not as, as strong as McGee did. And I'll talk to you about the evolution of this thought in just a second. But uh, that is, when we talk about the kingdom there are three views held by Christians about the kingdom. One is that the kingdom of God is entirely future, is entirely future. The second is that the kingdom of God is entirely present, that it is here in its fullness, not just in its fullness, but in its completeness. It won't get any better than what it is right now or stronger. And then the third is that the kingdom of God is present, but will be fulfilled or completed when Jesus returns. So it's present now, but it will come in its, the, the, the theological word is consummated when Jesus returns. Now, I'll just tell you right off, that's what I hold to. I hold the kingdom of God is present now, and is growing um, to define the kingdom of God. Let me define it. The kingdom of God is the, is the rule and reign of King Jesus 
over um, his people, ultimately over all of creation. All right, it's the reign of Christ, the kingdom of the kingdom of God. I believe that the first, the kingdom of God is entirely future, is an error because it it misreads what Jesus came to do. What what the early proponents in the stream that J. Vernon McGee, John MacArthur are in, what they believed was that Jesus came to be the Messiah. And, and really, those early proponents came to be the Messiah that the Jews wanted. Political, um, financial, successful, glorious, right then. Jesus came to do that. And they refused him. And that refusal culminated in chapter 12 of Matthew, where they say that his, um, he was casting out demons by a demon, by Beelzebul. And so when they rejected Jesus, this, this line of thought goes, when they rejected Jesus, Jesus withdrew or actually postponed the kingdom. So he had come to completely fulfill what we would call the millennium right then. That was his goal. He came to do it. They rejected him. And because they rejected him, Jesus then had to go to the cross for the Gentiles, the church, and that this time that we live in right now, that what we call the church age, was an unforeseen time in the Old Testament and that at the end of the church age, God will remove the church and will start again with his working of purifying Israel to become the kingdom that he came to set up the first time. Now, what this means, among other things, is that the first, really all the gospels don't belong to us. They belong to the Old Testament. And that means the Sermon on the Mount's not binding to us. Schofield, uh, if you know Schofield notes, Schofield is part of this. Schofield said that the Sermon on the Mount is a, a bad thing for Christians because of, because of this. It was, it was meant for the kingdom. And so um, there'll be a time at, at the end of the age when Jesus, when Jesus comes back and takes his church away, then he'll restart everything. So the kingdom was postponed until God, uh, Jesus can work with, the, with Israel again. That's what's called dispensationalism. That's dispensationalism. And that's this idea of the kingdom. Now, over time, um, I gave you what I just told you was what's called classical dispensationalism. Schofield, Ryrie, those guys, those old, old study Bibles that you've got. How many of you got a Schofield study Bible at home? Yeah. Schofield notes. That's, that's what I just told you is all from that. It's all, it all comes in that, in that form. Um, over time, Ryrie and some of the other ones, Pentecost, I quoted Pentecost on the back of your paper. Uh, over time, they revised it. And so it became a revised dispensationalism. In the 90s and forward, so recently, we've gotten into what's called progressive dispensationalism, and they've gotten rid of what I just told you about the kingdom. They really believe that the kingdom is here now and will be, uh, and also will be fulfilled. So they're, they're kind of moderating their views. So there's been an evolution of these views. But if you believe this, if you hold to these distinct uh, settings, then, then it, it's really hard to read the Bible the way they read the Bible. You have, to, you have to really fiddle around with it in order to get it that way. Now, they've done a good job of it. They've got all kinds of charts and maps and other things that bounce here, here and there. But, um, but all that said, it all has to do with the nature of the kingdom. So the, those classical dispensationalists, the ones from the early years, 
And by the way, this, didn't, this thinking didn't, it hadn't always been. It came about in the 1800s. That's when it was developed. It, it's not like the early church believed this. This, is, this just developed over time. Now, they will say that the early church did, and then you say, prove it, and they say, well, we can't. So, <laughs> but they, they bring it, and what happens is it means that God has two peoples, that there are two peoples of God. There are the physical peoples of God, who are the Jews, and there are the spiritual peoples of God, who are the Christians, and never the twain shall meet. Like, in fact, some of those early classical people believed that, that in the new heavens and the new earth, the Jews would populate the new earth and the, and the Christians would populate the new heavens. Like, there wouldn't be any, any connection. Uh, it, it's, it's just a difference. But that has driven th this idea that I just told you about drives what we think is going to happen at the end times. So if you hear me talk about the end times and you think, man, Pastor Jim doesn't sound like I've always heard people sound like, it's because I'm not a dispensationalist. I don't hold these things. So if you're a dispensationalist, you have to have a time where the church is raptured out of the, out of the world, pre-trib, pre-millennial, it has to come out so that God can then restart his program with Israel. That's the whole purpose of this. It drives whatever. So the Left Behind series is built on dispensationalism. And, and so it, most, in fact, most evangelicals in America, probably at least in eschatology and what they think about end times are all dispensational in their, for not all, most of them are dispensational in their approach. Um, and so that's where, it, I don't have a problem with a pre-mill, pre-trib rapture in and of itself. I have a problem with dispensationalism. That's what I have a problem with. And so when I teach this, going forward, I'm getting ready to introduce you to the kingdom. I am going to be preaching and teaching this idea that Jesus came to fulfill the kingdom, and in the kingdom are both Jews and Gentiles, and that's the way they're going to be for all. In fact, everything that I've said up to this point, all in Old Testament survey, has led to this. I just haven't introduced you to this thought. Now, before I go any further, how have I confused you? What do I need to say? Or is everybody good? Was that fairly understandable? Now, what I don't want to do is, is either make you feel bad, because I, I don't want to do that, I don't want to dissuade you about the way that you believe. I just want you to understand why I might interpret the Sermon on the Mount, for instance, differently than some other pastor that has talked to you about it. I believe the Sermon on the Mount is for Christians. I believe it's for people who have repented of their sins and trusted Christ, and it is the teaching of the kingdom. We belong to the kingdom, the way I view it. We belong to the kingdom. We're here now. It ought to have bearing on our life. And that's the way that I'll teach it and everything else going forward. Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir, Steve. No, 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 no. I go along with the kingdom of God is present, but will be completed when Jesus returns. Yeah, I'm, I'm number three. Uh, the old, um, I'm going to use a word that means something completely different now than it ever did. And, and so that's a terrible thing to do. But the old social gospel liberals of pre, you, what I'm talking about is pre-World War I, old social gospel liberals used to say, the kingdom of God is here now, everything is getting better, it's rosy, we're all going to be good. That's, that's somebody who thinks it's all here now. All right, and now I would suggest that there aren't many people like that now. That 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 both be, I mean World War One. I, I don't know how many of you know history, but World War One messed up everything. It, we don't talk about World War One much because it's kind of an afterthought. But the advent of the machine gun and the tank and chemical warfare and the the fact of people getting slaughtered by the millions in trenches. Um, it in, by the way in Christendom, uh, at least in Europe, all of the parties of that all claim to belong to Christ. And so it, it blew the lid off this idea that the kingdom of God was here and now. 
And so uh, that, that, that's a, but no, I'm, I believe that it's here, but it, it will come in its fullness when Jesus returns. Thanks for letting me clarify that, because that's, that's important. Yeah, I, I, think, I think Christians, so here's what I know. I know that throughout history, Christians have gone through um, tribulation, like, and, and I know that Jesus tells us, and so does his, the apostles in other places, he says that we ought to expect tribulation. Now, I know what you're asking. You're asking about the great tribulation. Um, I do believe that we'll be, uh, I do believe we'll be in part of it. I don't believe we'll be in the fullness of it. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure where I am in the, in the coming of Christ, but um, I could even be convinced of a, of a pre-trib rapture. I, I'm not against it. I just am not for it for the reasons that some people are. I'm not for it because I think he has to get us out of the way to deal with Israel. I don't think that's the case. I, here's what I believe. I believe that every person who's going to be saved, every person who's going to spend eternity with Jesus, wherever, new heavens, new earth, wherever. I, I believe that every person has to come by faith through Jesus alone as Lord. I do not believe there's going to be a political move that saves sinners from their sins. All right. So that's, that's where I'm strongest against. So how it plays out, I'm not sure. I know what I believe leading up to that um, if we go through some of the tribulation, I will not be surprised because they told us not to be. But if he takes us out before that, I won't be surprised because that would be just a demonstration of his goodness. And so I, I, am, not, I am not dogmatic about that. I'm not dogmatic. I believe that um, I believe there is coming a day, both from 1 Corinthians 15 and also from 1 Thessalonians 4, where the Lord will descend with a shout, with a trumpet blast, and we will all be changed. All right, we will all be changed. I also believe, and this, this kind of goes into some future stuff. I, I'm not going to get there now. But I also believe that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. Ask me why I believe that. <laughs> Jesus said that. The Bible says that. That's right. That's why I believe it. So you have to, however your end time scheme comes, whatever your belief about the kingdom comes, it has to be newborn people born again and ultimately transformed in their, in their bodies to be like Jesus. So uh, the way I approach things is not from a scheme, but by taking everything that the Bible says about those end times and just saying, well, this must be true. And there are some things that seem to conflict in that, and you just have to let them conflict because the Bible is true. Does that make sense? I, I am not going to be satisfying to you when it comes to end times because I cannot, like some of those guys I mentioned earlier, flip a chart up here and say, this is exactly how it's going to go. I don't think that anybody can. I think there's a lot of people who have tried, but I think it's wrong uh, because I think that if... think. With everything that God gave us, if it was necessary, he would have given us a chart. But he didn't. So it's not necessary. I believe that the Bible is sufficient in what it says. And so what the Bible says is enough. Some of you have asked me in the past, and I know a lot of people have it, well, what about heaven? What's heaven going to be like? Well, all I can do is show you what the Bible says about heaven. You've already read it all. It's, what it says about heaven is here. Anybody that goes beyond, they're making it up. And I, or at least I can't corroborate it through Scripture. And I am such a, I don't know, legalist is not the right word, but I am such a Bible guy that if the Bible doesn't say it emphatically, I am not going to say it emphatically. And if the Bible does say it emphatically, I will. So that's where I'm, I am in all this. Does that make sense? Is everybody good with that? All right. Now, if you, if you would classify yourself as a dispensationalist, we've got no bones to pick here. I can speak your language. I understand it. It's just not where I am. It's not the way that I take the Bible uh, apart. Um, and, and so I, I was reared in a church and in a tradition that was. I heard some of the, some of the leading speakers myself. I just, I don't find it 
satisfactory when it comes to reading the scriptures. That's not the way I approach it. And mainly, my main reason is because to say that the cross was plan B, that Jesus came to offer the kingdom, the kingdom didn't, they didn't take it, and so then he went to the cross. That, to me, is almost heresy. Jesus came to die. It is. It is. It is prophesied. All right, good. Let's go. The gospel of the kingdom. Now, I needed to say that because I believe that what Jesus came to do was offer the kingdom. Not just offer the kingdom to Jews, though, to offer the kingdom to all the folks. Because if you read, listen, this is so, so, so good. If you read, you end with chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount, and you go to chapter 8. Hold on for a second. Jimmy, you don't need to take a picture of this. I gave it on that little sheet of paper. It's right there. So um, it, if you go to, I mean, you can take as many pictures as you want. I'm just saying, I think I already gave it to you for you. But the, but the cool thing is, Jesus comes down off the mountain from doing the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7. Chapter 8, he goes right into a centurion who is not a Jew. A centurion heals his kid and then says, greater faith in all of Israel haven't I found than this guy. He didn't say it quite like that, but you understand what I mean. He said, I've just found the best faith I've ever found, and he wasn't even in a Jew, it was a Gentile. Now, I'm not against Jews. If you understand what Jesus came to do, he came to preach the gospel to Jew first and then the Gentile. Paul, Jew first and then the Gentile. That we could be, uh, that we could be saved. Righteousness goes from faith to faith to the Jew first and then the Gentile. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for the Jew first and then the Gentile. And so I believe, I see it all the way through. Even in the Old Testament, you remember, I've shown you all the way through, the Jew first, but praise God for the Gentiles. They're always there. Maybe not in the same number, but they're always there. And so this gospel of the kingdom, we start with the baptizer's ministry. I read that to you. Um, By the way, that was foretold foretold in Isaiah, but also foretold in Malachi. We like to think that... uh, that uh, there's this big gap between Malachi and Matthew, but there's not. If you go to Malachi chapter 4, there's the promise of the one who would turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the hearts of the children to the parents, uh, who would precede the, or who would be in Elijah's role and who would precede the coming day of the Lord. And the next thing we see is John. John walking out and doing, that's, the, that's not by accident. Yes, sir. Yeah, just uh, just prepare the way of the Lord. It's a it's a way of saying I'm going to clear the pathway. I'm going to clear the path for for the Messiah. And so um, there was already so when Jesus walks onto the scene, there was already a, a stir, a, 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 a spiritual stir, because you've had this Old Testament prophet preaching like an Old Testament prophet preached, and there hadn't been one for 400 years. And so he's out there preaching, and their hearts, it says that all Jerusalem went out to hear him. And so what he's doing, his whole ministry, is is, um, clearing the way. That would be the way I would say it today, making the path straight, clearing the way for the Lord. Yeah, getting rid of the misinterpretations, Um, In fact, what you see, and you don't just see it lightly, you see it strongly, is that everything that they had been doing, think Sadducees, Pharisees, scribes, think that, everything that they had been doing was now confronted by a man named John. And, And his way of living he was dressed differently. Remember, the, the rabbis used to love to show their fancy clothes and, and all that. John is in a, in a camel skin tunic. <laughs> How scratchy is that? I think burlap bag, you know. Hey, he, he walks out in that thing. He's eating different than they eat. 
Rem uh, this is just an aside. This is not biblical, but in your mind it may draw it. If you remember the chosen and, and remember Nicodemus and the way he lived and ate, remember it shows them and the rabbis eating that really, those really good foods and the grapes and all. I mean, just think of the ornate tables. We've got John completely different than that. And so it's a confrontation. What we have in John is a confrontation of the status quo. Yeah, creepy John. Creepy John, he's a, he's a confrontation of the status quo. And that's because he's about to introduce the one who should be the status quo, and he's completely different as well. In fact, in chapter 11 of Matthew, we see that John came, uh, John came preaching in the wilderness, and you rejected him, and the Son and Man came eating and drinking, and you rejected him. And, and, and that's a terrible, that's a terrible thing. They, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the, the whole thing, there was nothing by accident in this. I mean, it, it was, it, if, so let's just put on hold for the fact that we know God is sovereign and he does all things according to his will. All right, let's put that on the side. If you were writing a book you couldn't have written it better than this. I mean, every, everything that needed to be repudiated was repudiated in John and Jesus and then the disciples. I mean, just, just everything. Unfortunately, and this is what scares me, y'all. Unfortunately, we have turned this movement that was originally called The Way, Jesus, The Way, we have turned this movement into status quo. That's what scares me. That's why I loved that movie on Sunday that we watched, uh, Jesus Revolution, because it shook up the status quo again. Now, I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not about shaking things up just to shake them up. But listen, if I'm in a wrong spot, I want to be shaken up. I want Jesus and nobody else. I want to be, I, I, I don't want anybody to say of me, man, Jim Collier missed it. Not because, not because I care about my name, but because I want to follow Jesus alone. Like, I, he's my hope. I, I love that song. At all, every time I say he's my hope, it reminds me of the Crowder song. All my hope is in Jesus. <laughs> all my yesterday's gone. All my sin is forgiven. <laughs> I mean, that, that's uh, washed by the blood of the Lamb. That's, uh, that's what I want. And I want to follow Jesus. I don't want to just be saved and go to heaven one day. I want every step of my life to demonstrate. I want to bear the fruits of repentance, which is what John told the, the, the Pharisee. Bear the, root, the fruits in keeping of repentance. I want that to look like my life. I don't want Jesus to ever have to say to me, Jim, you're an idiot. I want him to say, hey, keep following me, son. Well done. Come on. Come on. Let me, so that, that's, so I'm all about the status quo being shaken, and that's exactly what we have here. Don't read this lightly. Don't read this lightly. This is huge. John, as he walks on. So uh, then we see the baptism of Jesus. This is why uh, all things must be fulfilled. Now understand, Jesus was not baptized for repentance. He was baptized for righteousness. Okay, now that's different than the rest of us. Uh, in fact, let me say, we, in a way, John's baptisms prefigured ours. So I believe that John baptized by immersion in the water based on repentance of, of sin. And so I believe that in a way, when I'm baptized, excuse me, when I'm baptized, I am expressing that I've repented of my sins. I've died to an old way of life. But that's not all that it says. It seems like when John was, was baptizing in water, that they were being baptized for repentance. I'm dying for an old, to an old way of life. We are not just dying to an old way of life, but we are being raised to a new life. And that's different. That life is in Jesus and I believe that that, wasn't, that, that that aspect of baptism did not come around until after Jesus rose again from the dead. 
So I think that Jesus' baptism points forward to his death, burial, and resurrection, and our following him in that kind of baptism points back to him as our only hope in his death, burial, and resurrection, and that we died to an old way of life, and we've been raised to a new one. Does that make sense? All right. So that's, that's the baptism of Jesus. Uh, immediately, chapter 4, Jesus is, goes out to the wilderness. Now notice, he is led there. He is led there by the Spirit. In fact, in the book of Mark, it says that he was driven there by the Spirit. Uh, now, I don't want to make a, a huge deal over the two, but I just want you to know that it was God's will, God's plan, that Jesus be tempted. And lest you think you're above or different than Jesus, it is God's plan that you and I are tempted too. God does not tempt us. But this idea of testing is God's plan for our lives. So that when we are tempted, let no one say they are tempted of God. And yet, it's God's plan for us to go through those kinds of testing. Does that make sense? Everybody good? All right. So we have this temptation of Jesus. You know the three. Um, by the way, one of my reasons for not accepting this idea that Jesus came to usher in the, the kingdom without death is I believe that one of these temptations is that. You can have it all without dying. And I believe that Jesus knew he was always headed for the cross. In fact, he said in Mark chapter 10, he also says it in Matthew, the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for the many. Matthew chapter 1, I just read, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. I believe that the death of Jesus was always part of the agenda. In fact, it was the primary reason for his coming. Uh, Isaiah 53 speaks to that. Um, for by his stripes we are healed. All that. Everybody good? So Jesus comes out of this temptation, uh, successful, by the way. Uh, he successfully, um, I'm going to end here because I, I want to say something else. Um, he successfully beat the devil by what? Scripture. By Scripture. By Scripture. So let me just say, if you think that it was important for Jesus to defeat the temptations of the devil by knowing Scripture, how much more ought it be important for us to know Scripture and to use it when we're tempted of the devil? All right, so that's, that's, a, that's one thing. But the second thing, and this is the theological side of this, is that recognize what we have. In the garden, God created man and woman in his own image. He created male first, then female, but both in his image. Male and female created them both. In their creation, Adam and Eve were not perfect. Don't use that word. They were not perfect. They were innocent. It's a different word. Same kind of thought. They hadn't sinned yet, but they weren't perfect. They were innocent. Then came a time of testing through the vehicle of the serpent. The serpent animated, representing Satan. I believe in some ways Satan was present in the serpent although it was the serpent that was there talking to them. Everybody good so far? Eve was tempted, and I believe in... I want to be real careful because I don't, this can mean lots of things, and I don't mean anything bad by it. I'm just talking about it in the, in the economy of the way that God, that God works. Eve was tricked, fooled, into eating the fruit. Adam willingly sinned against God when he took the fruit and ate of it. Now, lots of people have said lots of things that went through Adam's mind. Um, <laughs> probably foremost is yes, dear. <laughs> but 
Yeah, it, there, there is the possibility that, that the sin was um, that when he allowed Eve to eat of it, uh, you could, and I've heard that before, obviously, uh, that, that the sin was when Adam allowed Eve to be tempted, that he didn't, he didn't protect her from the, uh, from the, the serpent. Um, all we really know, we, we really know two things exactly. Again, remember, I'm falling back on Scripture. Here are the two things we know exactly. We know that it was the eating of the fruit that God had commanded them not to eat that was the sin. So disobeying the Lord, that's the sin. And we know that God held Adam accountable for that sin. It was in Adam all sinned. Romans 5 says. And so there, there's, there's more to it possibly. Um, I, I've read, I think I've even told you, G.K. Beale, who is, a, who is a theologian way smarter than me, um, does say that because he was the co-regent, Adam was the co-regent in the garden, he was set there the garden to protect the garden, he should have killed the snake. That's, that's, I've read that, that he should have killed. And so that because he didn't, everything else has fallen apart. Uh, so there may be more to it than what I'm saying. I'm just going by the, the biblical statements. It was in Adam that we sinned. Um, and Adam sinned and all his progeny sinned after him. So we all have inherited Adam's uh, sin nature, Adam's guilt, all of those things. There are, there are people, Baptists included, who don't like the idea that we're held guilty because of Adam. So I always remind them, well, at the very first opportunity, you sin too. <laughs> so it's not just Adam's guilt. You're guilty too by your own volition. But be that as it may, in Adam, the sin of humankind is perpetuated. What we have in the first four chapters of the book of Matthew is the introduction of a second Adam, someone else. Now, unlike Adam, I do believe that Jesus was born perfect. I distinguish between innocent and perfect with Adam because it's a distinction that needs to be made. I, I, I think we press it, we, we, we're liable to press it too far either direction with Jesus. But what we see is a similar we're supposed to see this, a similar temptation in Jesus' temptation, a testing, if you will. So if, if you were to say, Pastor, when was Adam and Eve tested? They were tested in the garden with the serpent. If you say, Pastor, when was Jesus tested? I would say that he was tested in the wilderness with Satan. So when he emerges from the wilderness, he comes back successful. He was tested. And by the way, he is tested throughout his whole life. I don't want to draw it just to this time at the wilderness. But in the wilderness, we are meant to know that he was tested in all the same points as we are. You say, what are they? I'm glad you asked that. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the boastful pride of life. We see that in the garden. She saw that it was good to eat. She saw that it was pretty. And she, took, she knew that it would make her wise. So she took of it. Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, boastful pride of life. We see it in here with the three different, uh, uh, the three different temptations of Jesus. Turn this into... Turn this into bread, throw yourself off the temple, uh, bow down to me, and all these things will be given to you. All those same temptations. And then in 1 John, it says that we are to hate the world and everything of it. And it says, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life. This is a theme about temptation and it's a theme, I believe, that Matthew intentionally, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, inserts here for us to know that we are now dealing with the second Adam, the one who is going to restore all things. Does that make sense? Isn't that cool? 
once again, I like to connect the dots. And so that's what I'm trying to do for you. I want you to see what, what's being done here. Now remember, these, these Gospels aren't written haphazardly. They are written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Matthew wrote exactly what God wanted him to write. This is his word. This is what we believe about inspiration. And so we have this, and it's all intentional. There's not a part of it that you say, oh, we didn't need that. It's all intentional, and I believe it's intentional to fulfill the purpose of the author, in this case, the purpose of Matthew, which is to show us the king and his kingdom. And so he's showing us, by the way, if Adam and Eve had not sinned, he would have been the king. That's what he was put here for, to represent the king of all kings. He was here to be the governor of the earth. He failed. It was removed from him. You say, when was it removed from him? He was kicked out of the garden. Well, now Jesus comes, succeeds, but his is going to be done around with differently because all of us are not like Jesus. We weren't born innocent. We were born sons and daughters of Adam. But what we really need is to be sons and daughters of the second Adam. So the second Adam died in our place, bore our sin debt. By the way, in him we died. In him we died. So the old nature died in Christ. Behold, all things have been made new. I am being crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. So now it's not the old Adam that lives it's the new Adam that lives, and it's the new Adam that gives us access to this kingdom and the kingdom eternal. That's the good news. The gospel is bigger than, I, I know I, I always say the gospel is Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture, was buried and rose again according to the scripture, but it's bigger than that. The, the God, that's how we attain to the good news. The good news is that God is rewriting all history. When Jesus rose again from the dead, he instituted the new heavens and new earth, the new kingdom brought in, we are all part of it as we're going, but one day all things will be new, completely new. All the old junk is going to be gone, and uh, we're going to enjoy him forever and ever and ever. Amen. And if that's not good news, you got a weird version of good news, because that is where we're headed. All right. Any other questions? I have a question. Ask it. Can anybody baptize someone? The answer is yes and no. I believe, and I'm different than a lot of Baptists, I believe that baptism is given to the church, the local church. So I believe that the authority to baptize is in the local church. That being said, anybody that the local church decides can baptize, can baptize. So the answer is yes, anybody that's born again can baptize, but I believe that it's up to the local church. There's other people who say, no, no, that's just, that's old fuddy-duddy stuff, but in some ways I'm an old fuddy-duddy, and I hold, to, I hold to the local church, and that God, I believe that God gave the authority to observe the Lord's table and the authority to baptize as ordinances of the church, and the church supervises them. That's a good question. I'm different than some, and that's not something to divide over, but that's what I believe. Yeah. To let somebody else do it. Um, yeah, yeah. Because, so, so here's, y'all, y'all hang on just a second. This is a good question. So I am not, y'all need to see this. I am not allowed to baptize because I'm ordained. I'm allowed to baptize because First Baptist Church Concord says I'm allowed to baptize. So if First Baptist Church of Concord says, I'm going to make this up because I know it's not true. Let's say Jimmy Green has a son. And Jimmy Green's son has been running loose all over America doing crazy things. And we've been praying for Jimmy Green's son, nobody more than Jimmy Green. And Jimmy Green's son repents of his sins, comes to Christ, comes back to our church, and says, hey, I'm a changed person, I would almost undoubtedly say, hey, Jimmy, you want to do it? 
And, and I, but then, so then Jimmy said, yeah, I'd like to do that. And so Jimmy walks out into the water with me. You'll hear me say this. All right, church, I need to ask you a question. Is it okay if Jimmy baptizes his son, who's been a, a rebel for all these years, will y'all let him do that? And then the church would undoubtedly say, yes, they have the permission from the church, and he would do it. I have permission from the church. It was a stated thing. When you called me to be your pastor, you said one of my things that you wanted me to do was to supervise the baptism. And so it's a kind of a standing thing that I have authority from the church. If the church ever wants somebody different to do it, all they'd have to do is, is say that and have that voted on. I, I feel free to ask anybody I want to baptize, but I will never let them baptize until I walk in front of the church and ask the church, is it okay? Because I believe that, what's that? Yeah, yeah, same thing with, uh, so, well, marriage is not a, marriage is not an ordinance of the church, but I treat it similarly. I treat it similarly, but it's not an, uh, not according to Baptist. Now, Catholics believe it. It is a sacrament, but I do not believe that. Uh, I don't believe in sacraments, but that's another story for another time. I believe in ordinances, things that the Lord told us to do. All right. Brad, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, you said having a dream when you were a parent. Yeah. Brad, Paul, yeah. Okay. yeah. Does that mean that Paul was unable to? <laughs> um, in... In, in theory, in theory, Jesus, in theory, the temptation was a true trial. It was a true trial. His temptation was true. It was real. I don't believe he ever could have sinned. But that's neither here nor there. In reality, he didn't. That's what matters. Ultimately, that's what matters. He didn't sin. That's right. Nope, don't use part. <laughs> that, that's why he didn't answer. Was true. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. And by the way, I'm not correcting you so much as guarding you. That's, when, I, when I do that, I'm guarding you. That's why I can't answer it, because Jesus is not two parts. He is two natures in one person, and they are inseparable. He, yes, he demonstrates. Yeah, he had to demonstrate. All of these things are true. Um, th this, is a, this is one of those theological questions that doesn't really matter. And what I mean by that is, could Jesus have sinned, yes or no? Um, we, don't, we don't know that, nor will we ever know that. He didn't sin, but it was a true temptation. He had to demonstrate that he didn't. That's what matters. Um, and so, you're, right, you're thinking right. I didn't mean to stop your thought. I just meant to stop your words, because we can't talk about Jesus as two, two parts, um, it's like why you won't ever hear me talk about the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. Same God. It's wrong to, to differentiate. They're the same God. Um, and so I, just, I was just guarding your words, not guarding your thought. Your thought was very good, um, I, but I don't have an answer for that. Um, right. Uh, yeah. Um, yes. Yes. So the difference between, all right, let's, let's say the man Jesus, the man Jesus, before we have any theological thought about him being God, just, just a dude that we see, and I, I'm, I'm using that on purpose, but not blasphemous. I hope you'll accept that. Just a guy. So somebody says, hey, come look at this guy. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Well, I'm going to come see this guy. All right. They didn't have any idea yet. They just see a guy. But now what they see is this guy who is living a perfect life, who's being tempted in lots of ways, tempted by the Pharisees, tempted by tradition, tempted by his mom and his brothers, tempted all the way around. He's being tempted all over the place, tempted by the devil too, tempted, 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 and he's not succumbing to it. 
So what they're seeing is a real temptation and somebody who's overcoming it. And so that's what, that's what they see. Now we know Jesus is also God. That dude is also the eternal God. So he's no longer any dude. But the God-man. So he's different than I thought, but I still saw him as a man overcome all these things, and now I know that he is God and he is transcendent above all things. That's all we need to know. Everything else we can have all kinds of questions about, but he, he did not sin. He will not sin. He has not sinned. There is no sin in him. He's the perfect sacrifice. And, but he was tempted in the same ways that you and I were, yet without sin. All right, I took way much more time, but we're talking about Jesus. What better reason to stay and talk? God bless you. Have a great day. Not next week. Remember, next week is Young Hearts Basket Distribution. Two weeks from now, I believe it's 29th, the 30th, the 30th. On the 30th, we'll be back together right here. God bless you. Have a great day.